and we're rolling overview of the Bible, Hebrews. We're picking up here. Uh, we're, we've just been talking about a better ministry, a better covenant, a better priesthood. And he still goes on in, in chapter 9 and compares those things, the old and the new. The old, he talks about the old setup in the temple and, and the regulations and the washings and all the things that went on there. And then he compares that here to Christ. And so we're just going to pick up, skipping past a lot of that in the first part of chapter 9. In verse 11, it says, But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation. Once again, he's saying that Jesus appeared in the tabernacle, the heavenly tabernacle, not just one that was replicated on the earth. And it says, verse 12, And not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. So this is a, a big statement, and that's why he's saying this ministry is so much better than the ministry of the Levites and offering bulls and the blood of bulls and calves, which you know kind of covered sin for a year, and then they had to do it again because, one, they were still sinning. They were sinful, the priests, and then for the people. But here, a perfect one offered the, his own blood once for all, and it's redemption for e eternity, eternal redemption. Uh, verse 13, he goes on to say, For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling, those who have been defiled, sanctified for the cleansing of the flesh. Uh, by the way, this idea of the heifer and the burned the ashes of the heifer has become something in, in uh, current uh, talk because uh, the red heifer needed to, to be sacrificed, the ashes burned, and, and sanctify a place for the building of a new temple. And so that's in the news again here. But he says, uh, if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctified for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works? So he says, how much greater is this sacrifice that Jesus gave? A perfect sacrifice. And it's a once for all sacrifice. It's not needed to be done perpetually. In fact, he just said, if, we, if a new covenant is introduced, the old one is obsolete. And for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant in order that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. And so uh, he's just saying that now that this new one's been introduced, all the things that were committed under the old covenant. And that's, that's the old covenant is, is there for why. Why is the law there? It's to point out our sin, to point out our weakness. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so when we understand that, we understand we're enemies of God because of our waywardness, because of our transgressions. We've actually become God's enemies and we're, we're acting against him. That when we hear there's a savior, someone that comes and brings redemption and we can be made friends with God, children of God, brothers of Christ, sons of God. You know, if we, we hear all this inheritance that we have, we should have a gratefulness of heart. You should. Uh, when you hear that message, that's the good news, the gospel. We were, we were condemned under that old covenant because none of us fulfilled it. And now a new one has come, and he's died once for all. It doesn't have to happen again. The only thing that has to happen now is initiation of our faith in him and to hold fast in that faith, and that's what the book of Hebrews is talking about. Hold fast in your, your, your confidence and faith. So he goes on, and we see a little another warning here. It comes at the end of the chapter, uh, starting with verse 22. According to the law, uh, almost all things are cleansed with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. You know, if you look through the law, almost everything uh, sacrifices with some kind of blood sacrifice. Not everyone, but almost everyone. But there was no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. Uh, there had to be life for life, blood for blood. Uh, therefore, it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So the copies on earth were cleansed with the blood of bulls and goats and other sacrifices, but the heavenly things needed to be cleansed with a better sacrifice. And so the, the better sacrifice was Jesus himself bringing the blood, his blood, being the high priest, offering the blood, and being the sacrifice, <laughs> being the blood that was, was offered. For Christ did not enter, verse 24, enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he should offer himself often as a high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood not his own. Otherwise, he would have had needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once, at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by sacrifice of himself. 
So this one time, this one sacrifice, it's enough. That's good because, you know, for since 70 AD, there hasn't even been a temple in Jerusalem to offer the sacrifices at. So, I mean, there's been, there's no, not even been a place for the sacrifices. And uh, so it's good that this once at the consummation of the ages when Jesus offered himself, that was good enough. And it says in verse 27, And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, so Christ also having been offered once to bear the sins of many shall appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. And so he's, he's giving the promise here, you know, uh, just like we die once and there's a judgment, you know, Christ offered once, one time, to bear the sins of many. And now he's coming to the second time. And this is going to be regarding salvation. And it's, you know, who's going to be saved? Those who have believed in him and eagerly await him. We're looking for his return. And so that's what he's saying here. So he goes into chapter 10. And, and he, you know, once again, going on the theme of one sacrifice of Jesus is good for all time. Uh, and I'm going to skip through uh, some of this again, getting to verse 10. It says, By this we, uh, we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily ministering and offering uh, time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. So he's, it, once again, it's just emphasizing that there doesn't have to be new sacrifices. There doesn't have to be yearly sacrifices. It's faith in the sacrifice that happened one time. Jesus offered the perfect sacrifice, being the only one who's ever qualified as a human being, as a perfect sacrifice to be offered, and he willingly gave himself. Verse 18 says, now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. You don't need another offering because there's been forgiveness offered through the blood of Jesus. And where there's already forgiveness, you don't have to keep on offering. You know, we kind of do that in our own way, I think, and just we keep on trying to give God some kind of repayment for our, our whatever we make a mistake, we sin. And we're trying to repay him all the time. Well, here he says that, no, once for all, there's no longer an offering for sin. Uh, it's, it's going back to that place of repentance and faith is the way this is all enacted. So in verse 19, he says, uh, Since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. This is a wonderful passage here, one of the highlights of the book of Hebrews. Therefore, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. Remember, that they could only go in the holy place once a year. And the priest had to go in and you know, he had to put on linen. He couldn't sweat. I mean, the idea of not being able to sweat would make me sweat, I think. I, I, you just, you, what, you couldn't even sweat. And uh, he had to go in and uh, could only do it once a year. He says, we have confidence now to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. This is kind of a summary of all the things that Hebrews has been talking about. We've got this new living way. He, he's our high priest. We can go in with our hearts sprinkled, our conscience clear because of the blood of Jesus. We don't have to hold, uh, be guilty or have shame over our lives anymore. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Hold fast this confidence. You know, don't let it go. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. And so this is good. Uh, it says uh, stimulate here. Some version says provoke, and that can be a dangerous word to learn how to provoke. I'm just provoking my brother. But this is to love and good deeds, not just provoking them. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. It seems as the day is drawing near in our day, as we, we can't seem to think, well, it's getting closer to the return of the Lord, instead of gathering together and not forsaking the assembly seems like the, the thing is out there well you don't need to have church you don't need to do this and we've had covid stuff and nobody meets together and you just you're online or whatever here he says don't forsake the assembling of each other together why you know people say well the church is just a bunch of hypocrites well yeah, that's what we got to work with you know and you know and if if we've got all these people that just you know still god's working on them it gives us hope that you know he can work on us he's working on them 
the way we uh, refine each other is, you know, we're not perfect people and we're working on each other and we've got to learn to forgive and embrace and love even when other people aren't perfect.